Um, this I, I should probably just sort of start with a brief introduction of how I came to do this um, work. And um, um, so I was, I was studying part two at Oxford Brooks and they gave us an opportunity to um, submit a proposal for a master's dissertation. And then you, um, you had a few years post finishing part two to complete it and you'd get a master's at the end of it. It's all different now, but that's what, what it was like at the end. And um, so um, uh, in uh, the, um, uh, when was it? Uh, yes, yeah, 2008 recession. Um, uh, my the practice I was working for at the time didn't want to make a fourth round of redundancy, so they basically said to everybody, "Oh, um, if anybody wants to take a sabbatical for six months or have a baby or something that means that we don't have to pay you for six months, and then hopefully we won't have to make a fourth round of redundancies, and then you can come back um, to your job." And I thought, "Oh, this is a good opportunity for me to do this research." Uh, based on the proposal that I'd already put in, which was about um, learning from vernacular buildings um, and their sustainability and putting them into modern sustainable housing design. And um, I knew I'd need to spend six months abroad researching it. Um, so this, I thought it's now or never really. So that's what I did. Um, and I, so I went to South America, um, Australia, Papua New Guinea, Vietnam and China and interviewed um, the residents of the houses, as well as architects, designers, housing associations, etc. And then I, when I came back to the UK, I um, followed up with case studies in some case studies in the UK, so that it made it more relevant. But um, I, I was really keen on because I think when you look at um, foreign buildings, you can appreciate the contrast more. Um, whereas we're sort of kind of used to looking at Cotswold country cottages and things, and don't maybe don't see the um, the um, the, you know, the sustainable aspects of it, particularly in the same way that we might spot it in a Chinese cave, cave dwelling. Um, but then I wanted to bring those lessons back to the UK. Um, and then um, I thought, oh, it's just gonna sit on a shelf for other master's students to read. And it seemed a, shame, a bit of a waste of research that could be useful to a much wider range of people. And um, so I, I, um, uh, I, I wrote up a, a, a book proposal. So it's based on that and then I added more European case studies and more UK case studies to make it even more relevant to what we're trying to do in the UK. Um, but um, I suppose I should also say the, the original reasoning for choosing this topic was one was real anger at um, how everywhere is just like red brick boxes, whether you're in Northampton or Southampton or Scotland or wherever. And um, uh, 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 what was the other one? Oh yes, and also the, um, the late, um, I studied vernacular architecture at, at Oxford Brooks, and at the time, um, the late Paul Oliver was teaching um, some of the some of the lectures, and um, he he really inspired me because he's an anthropologist and he stayed with tribes and lived with all different kinds of communities all over the world. And him and Marcel Belinga wrote the vernacular encyclopedia of the world, um, which I just read and read and read. It's so interesting, um, and I thought I'd like to do something similar. Um, so that that's a little bit of background. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, I try to, be, it's really tricky to do this and I think, I think you can get a bit sort of um, bogged down with being very rigid about what vernacular and what traditional is and, and so on and I've tried to loosen it up a little bit so it's a bit more um, practical in terms of how you can use it in modern day building. Um, but I've, I've loosely grouped it into eight things that um, make up a vernacular approach. Um, as listed there, so learning from the past, sustainability and climate, um, scale, design, the ordinary community, landscape and placemaking, and craft. And I'll go through all of those here um, next. Um, so, uh, the, and the other thing that was really irritating to me at the time was that we, as a nation, we're known for being really eccentric and really forward thinking in terms of fashion and music and all this other kind of design stuff. but but we're rolling out these kind of standard identikit, really boring boxes in, in housing, which should be the most important thing. Um, whereas in the past, we had this rich variation of, you know, these are just three, so that's Norfolk, Scotland, and uh, Dartmoor Longhouse. Um, here's some more Norfolk, again, um, but different di uh, cottages this time, Flint ones. And um, uh, those are in York, Joseph Rantry built those workers' cottages. Uh, Cotswold Cottage there and and then you know the identikit suburbia box stuff um, which is really disappointing isn't it and um 
So yes, this is a, uh, one of the Chinese um, case studies I looked at, which um, they're, they're inherently sustainable because um, the they, uh, Xi'an University research um, discovered that they maintain a constant 16 degrees internally, these cave dwellings, even though um, the in that part of China, which is quite north, um, it the temperatures fluctuate massively between winter and summer. So this, and they wanted to retain that in new versions of um, cave dwellings for um, modern people, because they, they had a big problem with uh, farmers um, moving into cities and not being able to afford to run their really modern concrete block flats, which um, you have to spend a lot of money on heating to keep warm. Um, whereas um, these Chinese, um, these original cave dwellings um, did that anyway with the support of a what's called a Kang bed, which I, I'm going to talk about a bit more in detail later. Um, so that, uh, on the on the left of the picture is the new version of the cave dwelling, um, and uh, on the, the the center one is the original form. Um, and then uh, this is in Chile, um, Santiago. There's a really um, pioneering architect called Marcelo Cortez, who. Um, has always, always been interested in earth building and eco building in general. And um, uh, so the, yeah, at the bottom there, these are, these are actually because of where these are and the um, Altiplano Desert, um, this is actually a mixture of stone and um, adobe brick there, um, that building. But in general, the, um, the local material is adobe, uh, um, but um, it's a kind of status thing. So um, richer people, want to build in brick or concrete and um, it's believed that um, poorer people should build in adobe so he was like right let's let's create something aspirational that rich people really want to live in so he he um, got got a vernacular technology which is in uh, Spanish is called quincha but it's basically wattle and daub and then he made it more um, more structurally stable um, by um, adding in um, metal lath which means that you can achieve much taller buildings like that one at the top there, which is three stories and, um, and also um, interesting shapes and angles like uh, that one top right, um, which is a dwelling. Um, so he's, he's turned Adobe into this thing for poor people into something really aspirational, which is very exciting. Um, and then uh, this, the top two are in Scotland. And um, so I, this isn't, this is related to the architecture, but it's also related to how we how we live today, which is in the past a crofter, which is um, kind of Scottish for living off the land farmer person, um, would have lived in you know one of those little white um, uh, they're called black houses I think from memory. <laughs> it's a long time since I wrote this book. I'm trying to remember the exact terms, but. Um, uh, they would have lived in those with very tiny windows to keep out the cold and the wet and um, drafts and so on. And um, but today we can build much more um, eco-friendly buildings and we can have lots of glazing. And because we spend far more time indoors, um, the the modern crofters um, actually want to stay inside so that they can they can view their chickens from within their home. Um, uh, and and that's what that's what we want now. We we spend more more time indoors so we need more light and um, uh, we can achieve warmth in other ways we don't have to worry about really tiny windows um, and then this one at the bottom is by mole architect or oh, i should say at the top that's dualcast um really fantastic architects in on the isle of sky and um mole architects and um, down here at the bottom and um that was um uh, they chose to have front gardens um the, the, this is for a housing association uh, front gardens is the main garden because it would in increase social interaction between the residents, but also because that way they face south and um, you can see some overhanging there for shading because these are passive house and um, uh, so and they, they had a bit of bother persuading the housing association to do this, but um, uh, and how they did it was look at the local vernacular like actually look at all these houses where front gardens are the main gardens in in um, these villages around Norfolk. Um, and and then um, I can't remember exactly what he called it at the time, but that little um, sort of front gate thing, which it also allows for um, rainwater um, butt as as well and uh, bin store and so on, 
um, he he got that idea from churches when you walk in and there's um, I can't remember what the the name for it was but there's a kind of little tall gate thing above um, and uh, these sort of things add lots of character to the development you know it's, it's not a red brick box <laughs> and it encourages community interaction and all when I interviewed the residents they all knew each other um, and this is in Germany um, and uh, so th this is sort of a, a combination of things really um, which is that in the past uh, people would have built as communities and they would have used um, local skills like being carpenters and things and they would have combined it all together to build houses this this is an architect that's a um, uh, he used to be a carpenter and well he still is he trains apprentices but um, but then he retrained as an architect later in life so now he he builds the entire house it, it, in even doing the MVHR system um, which is quite unusual for an architect um, and um, so uh, and yeah and he, he he's using timber you know really local timber and it's part of his whole ethos and way of doing things so um, it is architect designed. I mean, we can't get around that. But vernacular um, architecture was designed by the people, for the people. And um, nowadays, we generally have designers top down building for you, unless you're fortunate enough to find a self build plot and do completely your own thing. But even then, you'd probably still need an architect. Um, uh, and then, yeah, this is um, Kevin McLeod's scheme that he did with um, Glen House Architects. Um, in Swindon, the Triangle, and they were inspired by the chimney pots on local railway cottages, and so they turned it into a passive ventilation strategy using passive uh, stack ventilation. Um, and then there's the thing about scale, which is that I think the house builders get wrong because they say that we all want this traditional cottage chocolate box thingy uh, with small windows, but we don't. We don't want small windows. And, um, and also they oversize it. So cottages are really, really tiny. And, um, and to make them fit to modern living standards, oh, sorry, I usually have it on silent. Um, to make it fit for modern housing standards, we have to um, make it all bigger, much taller and so on. But so it doesn't work. They've just taken a little cottage example and just blown it up. And then um, that's just really, it doesn't work. I don't think that's what's called learning from the past to develop future modern housing design that actually works for people. And then, of course, everybody that moves in and gets fed up with the lack of light and then they just plonk a conservatory on the back, which isn't the best solution anyway, because it's too hot in summer and too cold in winter. Um, and then, uh, yeah, design. So uh, vernacular architecture isn't a style. Uh, it's just designed purely out of practicality. So what was available, what was local and perhaps the taste of the local craftsmen would be involved as well. Local culture, obviously, uh, I mean, the, the Chinese example before, um, the cave dwelling is really um, important to the people because um, Chairman Mao, although it, you know he's got questionable um, things that he got up to, um, is, uh, but, but he's, re he's still revered in China. So, and he plotted the communist revolution in one of these cave dwellings. So they're really important to them culturally which is one of the reasons why they, they um, wanted to build new cave dwellings. Um, so, and, and this is just to highlight the, the variety. And these are all in the UK and not one of them looks like a red brick box. Um, and yes, the ordinary, I, I sort of think sometimes we can get too hung up in trying to create something new and exciting and so on, but there's nothing wrong with ordinary, it's actually, really attractive and um, especially as a group and and it helps to create places when things aren't you know pulling your eyes in loads of different directions and um, it's it's quite pleasing um, so that's that's uh, the triangle in Swindon there um, with the the passive stack chimneys and and uh, they recreated a, a village green so that people interacted with each other and then this is Lancaster co-housing here at the bottom um, it's quite basic I mean, I'm sure the architect wouldn't mind me saying it's it's quite simple architecture. They had lots of constraints to deal with, like um, the the river being adjacent and the um, the land levels and so on. So it um, had lots of difficulty on from that point of view. But the the actual style of the housing is quite simple. But there's lots of extra bits that really make it work as a place. 
um, yes, community. Um, so as I was saying before, people in the past used to design in groups and um, as, as communities, small communities like in villages or farms or, or wherever, and you know, they used to have big parties at the end where they put the roof on and so on. And um, we've lost all of that unless you form part of a um, co-housing group, um, which people do. They sign up for years in advance and form groups um, of people that share the same aspirations. And then they're just waiting to find land where they can build. And it, it can take years and it shouldn't, it shouldn't need to be like that um, because these kinds of developments lead to real, really interesting pockets of development that are so different from everything else around them. Uh, and um, and lead to really really strong communities where um, childcare and elderly care are just part of the whole thinking. Um, everybody looks out for each other. There's like sharing economy, so you don't need 15 lawnmowers. You only need one. You don't need 20 different spades and garden tools and power drills and so on. You can you can just have one and share it. It, uh, it makes so much sense from a sustainable sustainability point of view and now for some reason we're we're just so focused on the nuclear family we have to have everything individual ourselves in our own house which of course creates storage problems for everybody and if we got to know our neighbors all much better we could all share and um you know there could be central points where we we borrow things and it, it's a shame that that's all gone and um i think that's what this kind of housing development throughout the book actually community was a really strong factor in all of the the um new housing designs um yeah so the top one is archetype in stroud it's one of the first co-housing schemes might be the first in the uk um and then that uh, the one at the bottom is um lilac in leeds um which is by white design um and um has a big central pond um for which which uh, tackled two things one was you know sustainable sustainable urban drainage but also wildlife and um focal point and um, and nice space to look at and so on um, and then yeah landscaping placemaking I went to look at um, a really exciting housing scheme in um, Holland near Delft and um, they were creating a completely new development which they wanted to but they wanted to create a kind of village feeling around it and they were wondering how how can we do that as architects, you know, from above, not like li literally a village developed over many, many years and started off as probably one little farm and then additions and additions and additions by lots of different people with different um, uh, aspirations. And um, uh, so they, they, they looked at um, the Mondrian painting, I can't remember the name of it now, but, but anyway, it has a lot of random squares on it. And so they wanted to create this sort of random network, which was defined by canals, it, it, it being Holland, canals are essential, um, and these little bridges across and green spaces that sort of interact with it. So it had to retain this sort of Dutch feeling of um, rural landscape. Um, but they also um, engaged five other architecture practices uh, and, and then mixed them up. So you don't get a whole street of one architect, you get little little spots of um, arch architects all over the place. And um, so you'd have to be uh, a real, as, as they called it, a real architect connoisseur to be able to tell which architect did which building. And it, it really works. I, I, I really loved that development. And, um, and the, other, the other thing they did was um, they, instead of having everybody parking on their own individual drives, they had much smaller uh, little roads where children could play and you could cycle, but you couldn't get a car in unless you were unloading or uh, unloading. Um, and, um, and then they had pocket car parks where you'd have 20 cars in one space. And um, nobody complained about that. I, I think so. Um, that might be a difficult one to get through from a UK perspective, but the benefits were enormous. It was lovely to see the children playing everywhere, feeling really, really safe. It's lovely to live on a quiet street with no cars going past all the time. Um, it's lovely not to look at the cars all the time. Um, yeah, and, um, and then this one at the bottom was originally made for the, um, the UK Olympics, the sailing, the, the, the Olympic sailors, and then they converted it into homes afterwards. Um, but I, like, I liked about it that it, it seemed to, rep it's in Portland um, near Weymouth, and it has this real sort of beach seaside-y feel to it, and it's all using local materials and, and actually uh, partly Portland stone, which, uh, as, as we know, is really, really expensive. But at that time, because it was the recession when they were building it, there was the rough cast Portland stone was the same price as the concrete block. So the developer took advantage of that and um, 
and made a much nicer development as a result. Um, oh, I think I've just uh, said that point already. But um, one of the um, things about the Dutch scheme was that they had all these really nice um, brick details, which actually that particular architect, um, Faro architect, uh, that are really famous for. But um, uh, they did it in a way, so they, they sort of created elements that worked um, together and then you could kind of repeat them in different in different ways and then it they spoke a lot with the bricklayers as well about how to make this thing more um, economical at scale and so they developed formulas to insert these kind of crafted elements at um, without adding loads of extra cost um, right yes yeah, so I'm going to focus on those things now um, yeah so these are all different developments this one is in um, uh, Bar, um, Barking in Dagenham in London, and um, it was based on alms houses. It's the the original plan for the development was to entice elderly people out of their very large family homes into um, nice bungalows, essentially, um, with a community feel. And when I was there interviewing the residents, um, people were walking past um, all these big windows here, their living room windows. And so when people walk past, they can wave at everybody inside, which which people were doing a lot because some of the elderly residents they're um, confined to wheelchairs a lot of the time. So they spend a lot of time sitting in their windows. Um, and uh, the, the crime rate is almost zero because of the, um, all the overlooking that goes on. Um, and, and it did entice all the elderly people out. And so they have more family homes in Barking Dagenham now available to families. Um, uh, yes. and. Um, yeah, I've already talked about that one, the beach houses, the village green, um, that was Lancaster. Yeah, I think I've covered those, right. Um, yes, there we are. That, so this Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie is the, is the title of the picture. And you can see some of the canals there splitting it up and the, the village-like streets there with, with the single cyclist. Um, I mean, you'd look at that and instantly think Holland, which I think is really brilliant. Um, and then this is in Scotland and um, near um, Plockton, on the outskirts of Plockton, which is near um, the Isle of Skye. And um, uh, yes, uh, the architect took inspiration from um, the vernacular in Scotland is sort of white house and then barn attached to it. And he said, over the years, the barns have all fallen down or become disused because people have changed their occupations from farmers to other things. And, um, and so now you just see white, White House, White House, White House everywhere. And the planners insist on building more White Houses. And he was able to persuade them through this development that actually you wanted a combination of White House and barn because that's the true um, history of, of the Scottish Highlands. And, um, and now he gives lectures to the planners about how to, how to uh, do contemporary design in Scotland, which is really brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, and this is in Austria. Um, and it's, to it's totally different aesthetic there. Um, and uh, for, for a while after having, after having visited, I was thinking, why don't we build more of this stuff there? And, um, and also because that, um, I think on the next, yes. Um, this is um, you know, three stories high apartment blocks in the middle of the countryside of the landscape, but it works because you have the backdrop of the mountains. And in the UK, you can't just plonk, you know, three, four stories high in the middle of a village. Um, although it would be great for density and, and so on, it, it doesn't work because we're so flat as a nation in comparison, uh, you know, notwithstanding um, obviously Cumbria and Scotland and so on, but, but um, in general, that, that's the case. Um, and, um, so this is, this is a, a single dwelling where they've taken inspiration from local barns in the landscape and so on and um, made it almost passive house. And, um, and in, in, in Austria, they're fortunate because um, university fees were so expensive for a long time that a lot of clever people trained in um, trades, particularly carpentry. So um, when passive house came along, you know, for Austria, I suppose it was almost 20 years ago, um, the, um, the, the local craftspeople already knew how to do it. And um, so it's just been quite easy for them to roll out really good quality eco buildings in the landscape. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so that, and then this is a housing association and um, they've, they've, working with the same architect, they've tested um, low energy, passive house, and then beyond passive house. So um, 
oh, I can't remember what they called it now, but basically they, they, they make more energy than they need um, and put it back to the grid. And, um, uh, but they took lots of inspiration. So on the, on the right-hand side is a 16th century passageway. So one of the things they do in Austria to save space in the olden houses was um, have all the circulation outside um, uh, through these sort of covered corridors. And um, they retain that in the new, in the new builds. Um, which also has benefits for um, passive um, solar shading. And then the, the other thing, this is exactly the same in the UK. Um, we used to um, live right next to our animals. We'd have adjacent little barns with the cows in and whatnot and, and benefit from their warmth. Um, and the same in Austria, you can see house and barn uh, are next uh, attached. And um, so, and I, I think passive houses have moved on from that. So now instead of animals, we use appliances to, to gain warmth. Um, you know, if you live in a passive house, you only need to turn your oven on to heat your pizza for 10 minutes and the whole place is warm, for example. Um, yeah, so this is a bit more about that Chinese one. Um, and this is a modern version of the Kang bed. And on the right is, a, is the, old, the old original version. I stayed in one of these cave dwellings. So that's the one I stayed in. And um, uh, so you heat on a stove and then the the um, warm air that comes from the stove goes through the bed before it goes outside. So there's, they call it like um, the mother because it's always warm and you can sit on it all day. You sleep on it and you sit on it during the day. Um, and it's a really, really efficient low cost heating system that benefits from the thermal mass in the, um, in the earth dwellings originally. So they retain that in their new um, versions of, of the cave dwelling. Um, and because um, um, I think I said in, in the previous slide, they they sort of put, developed a list of what they called were regional genes, which was basically elements of the vernacular that were really worth preserving because either people like them culturally or um, they had massive benefits from a sustainability point of view. And then they combined them with some modern methods of building, you know, to, to make sure that they were structurally sound, for example. And um, they added um, bits of concrete in certain elements. Um, for modern building standards. Um, yes, and then this is in um, Bolivia, um, where they also have a status problem, um, same in Papua New Guinea, um, where uh, it's traditional to build in adobe, but um, if you want to demonstrate some kind of wealth, then you should build in brick, which um, this is the Bolivian Altiplano, which is basically like a desert, so it has huge diurnal temperature range. So people that live in these new brick dwellings were going to bed at six o'clock because it was so freezing. Um, and um, so some Dutch architects came over to try and um, come up with, working for a charity to try and come up with a, a better solution um, for, for building new homes for the, the poorer people. Um, uh, yes, and this is a picture on the right of, um, it's, it's what we used to do in the UK as well. We used to have a stone facade Here's showing a brick facade, and then behind it was all kinds of stuff. So this is a brick, this is a brick um, facade, and then behind it is adobe. So they're trying to say to the world, "Here I am in my brick, brick house," but actually the majority of it is adobe because we couldn't afford to do the rest of it like that. Um, so this is the modern version of um, uh, that the, the, the Dutch architects proposed to help sol um, create the solution. So in the same way that Marcelo Cortez was trying to create an aspirational um, architecture so that rich people wanted to live there um, and therefore everybody would would want to live in adobe houses again and um, the same kind of thing applies here so the uh, except that these are very buildable they're just adobe brick you, um they they gave these people um uh, sort of like ikea handbooks of how to put together these parabolic roofs and everything and um they they just built them themselves and um uh, they've been really successful. I, uh, when I, while I was there, I kept spotting them out, out of the window on my bus journeys and things. And um, so it's made a big improvement. And most importantly, of course, um, uh, they no longer have to go to bed at six o'clock in the evening. Um, it's, it's a comfortable temperature all the time. And um, the other thing that they retained was um, like, very similar to Papua New Guinea, people actually don't spend that much time in their houses it's all kind of in the spaces in around it so you have um, a house for sleeping and a house for cooking and and then there's your toilet area and then you sort of interact in between so they kept that they didn't just create one big house that solves all the functions which which you find in the Bolivian cities now partly because of colonial 
in um, introductions, but um, but also because they're looking at Western ways of building and think that applies to their lifestyle. But actually, people still want to live in the old way. Um, yes, and then this is in Australia, um, and um, uh, yes, by Lindsay Johnston, who's a really close friend of Glenn Merkett. Um, and so that's how I met him because I went there originally to interview Glenn Merkett, um, but got chatting to Lindsay Johnston along the way. And um, so his house is really interesting because it takes a very simple analogy, which is of uh, shade. So if you um, imagine sitting under a tree on a, on a hot day, you're instantly cooler because you've got the shade and also the ventilation above your head. Um, and he had spent time um, on holiday in Africa and he said people often park their caravans under big sort of um, uh, shaded tarpaulin things. And, um, and he thought, oh, that's a good idea. And um, why don't we just make two roofs for houses? So that was his principle there. So that that's um, uh, he essentially he's made a kind of shed under which he stuck his house. So you get the ventilation in between the roofs. And if you know Glenn Merkitt's architecture, he also does exactly the same thing, but it's more integrated. So he has two roofs quite close to each other to allow lots of ventilation underneath. Um, uh, yeah, so that, uh, those are pictures of, of that. Um, and then this is Papua New Guinea. And the original house is, um, uh, it's, it's made of um, bamboo and sago leaf, um, but, uh, again, because of status reasons, um, they they think it's aspirational to have a tin roof, which of course just bakes your head in in that kind of hot climate. Um, and uh, so, but because um, some of these original villages had to be relocated because of gold mines, um, the gold mine company had to provide new housing that the people were satisfied with and that felt suitably aspirational, but was also sustainable because. Once the gold mine goes, all the generators go, so there's no power. Um, and um, so that, that was a big consideration. And all the um, the people that I interviewed, they all wanted air conditioning. And um, the, the um, mining company was having real bother trying to explain to them, look, we're not gonna be here forever. You, can't, you won't have anything to run your air conditioning. Um, so we have to come up with these different strategies, which come from the vernacular, you know, big, steep, sloping roofs, lots of shade. They, um, they all um, congregate underneath the houses. That's part of their way of being. They actually only use um, their house for sleeping and storage. It's, it, they don't entertain or, or anything in there. Um, cook, cooking's always outside. Um, uh, showering and so on is outside. Um, so uh, they were trying to recreate that kind of thing. Um, and also lots of water collection for obvious reasons. Um, and then this is in um, Wales, on the edge of Cardiff, in St. Pagans. And um, it was a former farm, um, but the, um, the architect who did it um, wanted to create a sort of barn style, eco home feeling to it, but also he's really keen to um, retain community. So um, these are open-ended gardens on purpose because be beyond here is a, is a big lake where people like to go and look at the lake and so on. But also he, he wanted to give people some privacy, but also ease of talking to the neighbors. And then um, on the right-hand side bottom picture is um, a shared carport sort of garage. So when you go to your car in the morning, you're likely to bump into your neighbors. And that was really thought about. That was part of his whole design concept. <clears throat> and um, so I, I went to interview all of them and um, they, they'd they only been there for, um, less than six months and they already knew the names of each other's daughters and cats and everything and that, that just wouldn't happen in a normal housing development I, I thought it was really astonishing um uh yes so and this is Lancaster co-housing development again and that's a picture of the the shed of all of their shared tools that they brought from their previous houses and um probably only I think only a small fraction of them now get used because they um as a co-housing group they divide up jobs according to skills so if you like gardening then you'll end up in charge of the allotments if you're really good at admin then you'll deal with all the energy bills and so on and if you like run if you like people then you'll be in charge of running the workshops that they run and, and so on and so things are done as a whole community but um using people's skills 
Um, and then, yeah, this is the lilac um, one in Leeds. And the, these are, uh, you, you might have heard of Mod Cell by um, the same, uh, Craig, um, the same um, architect in charge of white design, Craig White. And um, uh, Mod Cell are um, prefabricated straw bell um, panels that, that he uses to make homes like this. Um, uh, yes, last thing. Oh yeah, and this is in um, in York. And what was it really interesting about this one was that um, it was Joseph Rowntree Trust was the client. And um, uh, so they insisted on really high standards of energy efficiency and eco development and um, community and, and also regional design. Uh, and because of that, um, uh, and, and surprisingly, you, you might think, um, Barrett Homes won the um, bid and promised to deliver all of this, but then massively marketed it um, because, you know, the old, the old thing was the house builders to say, nobody will pay for this. They don't get it. They don't know what it means. And, um, but actually, they made so much money on this development, um, which just goes to show that people do get it and they do want it and they are prepared to pay a premium for it. Um, so that, that was just, you know, a bit of an aside, really, that house builders can do it and it does pay. Um, yeah, I think that, that's it. Yeah, the end. <laughs> Great, thank you, Claire. Uh, that was fascinating. Whistle stop tour through your uh, travels and everywhere you went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great to see some of those examples and uh, some of the ideas that we can use in our design. Um, I will open up, we have a few comments, I think. If I, can find them. I will open up the floor to questions. Um, uh, let me go back. James D.E. Cross, you put a comment or a question. Did you want to ask yourself or would you like me to? Read it out. Well, James asked about the uh, Paul Oliver book you mentioned at the beginning, the World Vernacular book, where where he could find a copy of this book. Um, I think it would be um, in architecture university libraries. Uh, I think I'm sure you can buy it, but it would be really expensive because it's so massive. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, you might have to gain access to the local architecture library, wherever that might be. Okay. Um, I had a quick question, um, start things off. I mean, I think architects are kind of often on board with these, uh, these ideas and will buy your book, but I was thinking about when you were talking about there with the Barrett homes, that it's, I feel like it's the, the local authority, the planners, the house builders that we almost need to, uh, change the attitudes of and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we kind of start this conversation with them I mean obviously we can we've seen that we can do it there's Goldsmith Street in in Norwich which is a passive house um, um, and my kind of feeling is that the planners need to be a bit stronger in their response I mean not far from us there's passive housing developments going up and they say that this is what people want but you know um, I'm just wondering what your views are on how we could how we could have these conversations with them to make a change or to start thinking about uh, these kind of changes. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I think there's a few things happening. I, I think sometimes, I mean, if if you were strictly following planning policy and guidelines, you would kind of end up with what the house builders produce, mm. and and it's only because us as architects know how to bend the rules and and actually so do the house builders but they don't want to because it's cheaper to build how they're building but um um yeah so i, th I think they're victims of their own guidelines in some ways um but also if it's hard for them to fight the um they've only got so much money to fight legal battles and so if a house builder is adamant that they're going to build in this way and they've got all the financial backing to prove that it's unviable if they do it another way. And also if they're promising affordable housing and community facilities and things, it's really hard for the planners to just say no, mm. um, or you have to build it in this way because the house builders just got so much um, financial backing and expertise that's paid for because of that, that they can just, you know, thump a great big document on and say, this is why we have to build like this. You know, it, I, I think it's quite hard being a planner from yeah. that perspective. Um, uh, so, uh, and all of the projects that I showed where there was the 
that there was something different. Um, that all came because the people who own the land had the aspiration to do something better or different. And, um, and at the moment, the house builders own the majority of the land for house building. So, but, but then I also think things are changing in that um, since um, we've declared climate emergency, councils really have to put that into everything now. So there will be more stringent rules for house builders. And then there's the new um, changes to um, the building regulations as well. Um, and, and, and also there are some positive things. Like I was speaking to um, somebody who works for a major house builder recently, and um, they said that um, uh, COVID forced them to split up trades because you can't have social distancing when trades were working on top of each other, finishing up a house. Um, so they had to separate them. So, uh, and they thought that would slow them down, but it's done the opposite. It's, um, they've achieved all their deadlines, but done much better quality. So that's completely changed how they're working as a house builder now. They're going to keep that system. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, so that's, um, that's positive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As you say, it's very, I guess there's so much involved. I mean, there's the current um, design, the new design guide that's um, uh, come out um, from the government which is obviously a consultation at the moment, whether that will be seen to be um, helpful or not, I guess it's yet to be seen, but um, yeah. I, I wish it could be a bit more like in Sweden, because in, in Sweden, um, the government still owns most of the land. And then when they sell it to developers, they, um, they only, each developer is only allowed to build maximum of 100 houses anyway. So the quality goes up because of that. But also they they set targets for energy efficiency and quality and so on that the developers have to adhere to but they have lots of control because they own the land mm -hmm. i wish it could be more like that <clears throat> here but we, we are where we are we are <laughs> but but also house builders at, at these um uh, conferences and things they all say that it, because part of it's a competitive thing um be, be, get between each other um so if if government sets standards they'll all adhere to them happily because it sets the level playing field but at the moment for one of them to shoot off and do this it doesn't make sense and um no. it, it, particularly as they're so shareholder run as well and it's all about dividends yeah exactly all comes back to the money so um yeah okay did any anybody else have a question at all for claire if they wanted to either type it or uh unmute themselves, turn the video on and ask Claire directly. Comment at all. We had a comment here from George. George, I don't know if you want to come on and... Yeah, can do. Hi, Claire. Um, it was it was just um, a little comment saying that, yeah, local authorities can definitely set their own energy um, targets, which are better than the, the standard building legs, but very few local authorities actually do take that advantage. Yeah, I think I think more of them will be doing that. I've, I've definitely noticed ones local to me have started to um, e even just for ordinary house extensions, they've they're requesting a sustainability statement to go with it. Mm. Uh, I th think that's a big improvement in the right direction. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, uh, there, there were some good um, um, sort of initiatives from, from Europe where, for instance, if developers um, promised to um, go as far as kind of passive house standards, they were allowed kind of more development on site or, you know, go higher, you know, higher stories or, you know, there was sort of tax reliefs, et cetera. So um, there's definitely kind of incentives for uh, people who sort of, put efficiency um, in, at the heart of um, what they do. Yeah, I, th I think there are ways of doing it. I, um, I ju just don't think that, like you just said, there's been much incentive before now, but I, th I think um, the, uh, the climate agenda has, has become much more important mm -hmm. to everybody. And it's ju you're just making yourself look unpopular if you don't go along with it. And, um, and I was listening to something else by the, um, I've forgotten his name, Ian something, the, the chap who's doing the, um, the Glasgow COP, the COP thing, um, where they're supposed to all talk about climate and agree as, you know, all the countries 
are coming together to talk about that. And he said, um, you're going to be really daft as a country now if you're not going to invest in the green economy, because what you're basically saying is, is that um, you'll you're you're investing in something that will lose money and lose jobs if you don't invest in the green economy <clears throat> i thought that was really promising as well definitely thanks george um i've had a uh, another question from james who doesn't want to say it himself but he said any thoughts on encouraging neighborhood plans to support vernacular building ne neighborhood planners um uh, to support vernacular, but uh, do, do you mean as in new new vernacular? I um, in I mean in general. I mean we found that um, I mean we're working on really small developments. Obviously, we're not big house builders or anything, but um, we found that the councils local to us seem to get it because it's um, you know it's it's using local materials and we're using pitch roofs because it rains a lot in England, so it it's, tends to be better to do a pitch roof, and. Um, uh, and that kind of thing fits in with their design style. So then if we all also add in big windows and um, some other extra bits that make it, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to be against sustainable design, definitely not. Um, uh, so they seem to quite like that, that hybrid of um, respecting the past and drawing inspiration from it, but also building something modern and um, relevant to today. Um, we, yeah, we haven't had any problems on that front. Just added a quote saying neighborhood plans are for parish level planning by community oh. forums. Yeah. Step. Yeah. I, oof, I would have thought they'd be up for that. Um, I kind of thought neighborhood plans was more about um, setting out areas where you, you're, you'd, if development has to happen, you'd be happy if it happened here rather than there. And, um, and yeah, I suppose you can set out parameters of um, sustainable design and so on. But I think a lot of the time, the people developing these plans, they're not architects or professionals or anything. They, they wouldn't exactly know what criteria to put down um, as an expectation, unless they've got professional help. Mm. I think if they're shown it, they, they would want it. Mm. Mm. Anybody else want to... Um show themselves or ask a question, feel free. No more questions? Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, then uh, just, or well, somebody just said that they have the book, they have your book and highly recommend it. A last oh, good. a good last thing to say. Oh, thank you. Hi, <laughs> Claire's book, <laughs> available. <laughs> on the RIBA website. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Claire. Oh, as somebody has just got another comment, Sarah. Sarah, I don't know whether you wanted to unmute yourself to us. Or... Yeah, hello. Um, I'm at Orchard Barn in Mid Suffolk. And a couple of years back, we got planning permission to reinstate a 1580 timber frame longhouse, like for like, uh, on the footprint of the original building. We're a community project and we're literally sourcing the trees from the local woods and we're using traditional hand tools. Bit of a challenge with current building regs. That's all I'm gonna say. Hmm. Um, trying to reinstate a building from 1580 in the current climate, but but it's very low carbon. Um, we're, we're locking up lots of carbon in it. And in terms of community skills development, it's it's huge. So I'd like to thank Claire for everything that she flagged up in her talk. Um, lots of merit and lots of notes that I've taken, which I'm going to talk with building rigs about. Thank you, Claire. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I'd say is um, uh, there's um, straw. Uh, they I don't know if they're still called straw works, um, but it's but it's Barbara. Um, anyway, I could I could send you the link, but um. She's built a lot of straw bale buildings and she also had really big problems with building control originally. Um, and uh, she got around all of those problems. Um, so she might be a good person to talk to. I've forgotten her last name, but- um, I'm, I'm aware of her, I'll find okay. it. Okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> if yeah. not, send me an email, Sarah, and I can, I can put you mm -hmm. in touch, yeah. Thank you. 
Great. Barbara you. Jones, yes, thank you. There it is, it's just come <laughs> up. <Yeah. laughs> thank you, George. <laughs> Great, well, thank you for everybody's comments and questions. And thank you very much to Claire, giving up your lunch hour um, to talk to us. It's been a great talk, we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, a lot, a lot for everybody to think about, I think. Yeah, oh, good. That, yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. I couldn't remember all of it exactly. <laughs> but um, it's a good re refresh for me, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, well, great! Thank you very much. Lots of comments coming in now, thanking you. So, yeah, thank you very much. Kicked off our uh, lecture series with a great talk. Great. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we'll have two more. We've got two more lectures coming up in the next couple of weeks. So um, there'll be some more information going out about those. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming and thanks to Claire again. Thank Cute. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Claire.